Good morning. I'm Jennifer DeLoey, an energy and environmental policy reporter for Bloomberg News, and I am delighted today to be speaking with White House National Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy. Gina, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for asking me, Jennifer. Uh, we should jump right in. Uh, you know, the focus of much of what we're going to be talking about over the next two days is corporate sustainability. And we have seen tremendous action and movement by companies to set sustainability goals and to pledge toward net zero targets. What is the federal government's role in, in fostering that private sector shift and ensuring that there is some accountability, that these private sector efforts are meaningful and can be measured? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. One of the things we decided to do um, not too long ago, really, only a couple of months ago, is to work with Janet Yellen and the national economic team here with Brian Deese and others to take a look at how we could start really working ourselves to make sure that where we had uh, some uh, leverage to get businesses to start accounting for their emissions, including the business of the federal government, uh, then and start reporting it in a transparent way, that it would give people a uh, better idea of where their risk and vulnerability lies as they're, as they're choosing who to have a business relationship with. And so we issued an executive order. Um, and it, we uh, laid that out a few months ago. Um, and it was basically to, to indicate that we're going to look at our own investments uh, through the eyes of, of an investor to see what we should be investing in, how we're doing our purchasing and procurement here in the federal government, so that we're looking to put our resources into companies that do disclose, that look at, at, at their, the, the risk uh, profiles that they're managing in their investment portfolios and in their businesses. And then we're look, working with the SEC and the FSOC and others as, as basically independent groups that we work with, but nevertheless feel like we could do a much better job at pushing them to routinize disclosure of climate risks because it really makes sense from everybody's perspective, whether you're an individual consumer in your own home or you're a large investor or you're a large business. Getting that done in a way that's consistent and, and you're able to compare and contrast gives you a, 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 an ability to lower your risk and invest where your values are. You know, uh, one of the things that's interesting to me about your role, uh, your new role, is that you really are trying to spearhead this whole of government uh, action and on climate change, really coordinating a lot of disparate agencies. I'm curious, you know, what's the most concrete example of, of how that whole of government approach is working and is a substantial break from the past? Oh, Lord, there's a lot of them. I, I think the one I just mentioned is clearly different. Um, and that took uh, across the entire uh, NEC to be delivering and beyond, frankly. And so we were excited about that. We're excited about the reaction to it because the private sector really reacted well to it. There were many that were already doing these disclosures. But the whole, this whole of government approach is, is really unique. Um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. We, we get together with something called, it's a, the, it's a White House Climate Task Force. And so basically we interact with 36 agencies and independent entities, and we get them together on routine calls to talk about what we see happening, what's not happening, issues that we may want to align on. And it's been very interesting of late um, to look at how we can use this, not just as a mitigation strategy. For example, when we did the federal procurement, every agency had to engage in that because we all buy things or sell things, right? We do stuff that's worth Re that's worth money and resources. And we had to figure out how, if we're going to buy an electric vehicle fleet, who has the capacity to do that? How much do we have? How do we transition? Where do we locate our infrastructure investments for charging stations? And then you go to something, and so that was an all across the board effort. But then we got to things like, look at the heat that's happening 
in, uh, in along in the Northwest, but in particular in Oregon and Washington, you know, places that you don't expect 117 degrees. You know when that happens that people will 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 die from exposure to that heat. Mostly it's seniors, sometimes it's outdoor laborers. So we immediately brought together a, a small resilience task force focused on heat. Now uh, HHS, Health and Human Services, is going to spearhead that effort. We went to HUD to put a notice out to everybody who actually was in public housing about where they could locate cooling centers. We had folks looking at, at how we could get access to federal buildings to see if they could be used as cooling centers in certain areas. We put out information on how LIHEAP, which is an energy program, could, you could use those dollars to actually buy an air conditioner and move forward with it. So that happened within the space of you know, three days time when you could get all these agencies that almost never intersect with one another to be able to talk to each other and, and sort of rally around some of these issues which are systemically impacting everybody and can use really unique tools of the federal system to, to, to address them. Now that doesn't mean we had all the answers, but it does mean now we have a broad resiliency group that, that is now across the federal family. We just had a big meeting with President Biden and Vice President, and the Vice President and many of the cabinet members got together uh, to look at, at how we could address the wildfires better. They brought the Western governors to the table. We had a broad range of discussion about how we could work together. We identified additional resources to be brought to the table right away. FEMA was at the table because for the first time ever, FEMA is now not just responding, but they have a, a $1 billion fund that can be used but to uh, give grants to communities for resilience efforts. So these are the things that are, are sprouting out. And, and frankly, um, it's by convenience and foresight that we have everybody together, but it's really by necessity that we do these things because uh, we are in a new normal. And if we can't figure out how to work together, then, then it's going to be you know, an impact on lives and property. And so we have to move quickly. Well, so while you are convening all of this federal activity and, and getting the agencies together, of course, you're focusing a lot of time and attention on Congress. Um, yes. You and the president have both talked a great deal about the importance of a clean energy standard to meeting the climate crisis. Do you see that as an absolutely essential red line item for the budget reconciliation package? Well, I don't want to say that anything is a red line, you know, because frankly, uh, a lot of the work that went into the bipartisan infrastructure plan was was really built a tremendous foundation for us to grow on. And as you know, Jennifer, we have lots of regulatory authority that we have, intend to use regardless, and we'll move forward with those efforts to try to tackle the climate crisis. But you, but you're right that some of the work that wasn't um, uh, handled yet. Uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure framework is now the focus of intense discussion. Um, it will be a budgetary process. And, and so there is a real opportunity in that process that the president has identified to do some more investments in clean energy and climate that we think are gonna be essential. The clean electricity standard is important. It's important because well, let me put it this way. The clean tax credits are really fundamental because they send businesses a long-term signal about where we're going to invest, where we think the world needs to head. The investments in electric cars are the same. Those are business sound business investment strategies where we're listening to who the winners are and looking at the benefits they bring for climate and making the right investments there. So we do expect that, that tax credits will be there and that they will be designed to be more effective than the last and that they'll be lasting for longer periods of time. But that sort of just means we have businesses ready what the clean electricity standard says is go. <laughs> 
don't wait, go, because we are going to put you on a schedule that says you get out of the gate and run and you keep running. And, and without that, there's going to have to be a regulatory strategy to move that forward. And I think we all can agree that a clean electricity standard can actually be that motivator out of the gate that will allow us to get the kind of uh, impacts at scale that we really need to have now. You can fall back on regulation if you don't get a CES through Congress. How might you also fall back on states to green things up if federal law gets bogged down? Well, we've been relying on them for a while, and, and I think it's, it's great as we are continuing to work with the states and local communities. We are definitely seeing states um, embracing the advantages that renewable energy brings, understanding that we need to make grid investments moving forward so that we don't have the kind of uh, uh, insecure system that, uh, that, that is, isn't able to handle the kind of temperature extremes that we're seeing. So, so I have great faith in states moving forward. They see that this is money saving opportunities. I think the energy you know, generation it, the, it themselves, the generators, see that this is the future. We're not fighting with Edison Electric Institute or anybody. We're just looking at, at what's reasonable and how do we move forward. Um, but local communities are really, uh, I think, been playing a, a larger and larger role as we move forward. Because we do have distributed energy, we do have energy efficiency. They're the best group to tackle some of the buildings and the housing. And if we invest in that, and we're clever with that as well, uh, and we invest in this new civilian climate core, which I'm really excited about, I think you get everybody seeing that this is, you know, not not a punishment to address this. This is actually an investment in our future. And if we can move it forward with that more hopeful stance, which I think it deserves, I think you'll get the private sector seeing where their investments ought to be made, what the winners and losers are going to be. And in the end, Jennifer, I, I love being on this program because uh, I want, you know, I get to, to explain that I think government's great, but government was not intended to do it all. It was intended, I think, to do the innovations like DOE is going to have the resources to do to innovate for the future, to do the demonstrations of new technologies we need. But in the end, it's going to all be about how did we show the private sector where money could be made? And if we can do that, then it's, it's just going to climb and the momentum is going to be the kind of high bar that we need it to be in order to address the climate crisis in a timely way. Uh, I mean, you're talking very convincingly about, uh, about how industry needs to be part of this and really buy into uh, all of this change, but, in, but the federal policy change too. Uh, you know, 11 years ago, President Obama enacted his signature legislative achievement, the Affordable Care Act, after numerous failed attempts, plenty of naysayers said it couldn't be done, and yet they succeeded in large part because they got early buy-in from stakeholder yes. industries, you know, hospitals and pharmaceutical companies. So I wonder, what are you doing on climate now to bring in emitting industry? Industries and not just automakers and uh, EEI and the utilities, but also oil and gas companies. Yeah, well, we're, we're trying to be as, as creative as we can, Jennifer. There's, there's no question that the fossil fuel companies recognize that there's a shift. I mean, I don't think they're denying that. Are they coming to the table with a full-throated response to that? No. Um, but the president, I think one of the reasons he, he really, in his in his campaign and in his, in his executive orders now that he is the president, is making it very clear that we have a time-limited opportunity here to make this transition. And so we, we have an all-of-the-above strategy. We're not taking things off the table. I just attended a meeting this morning and, and did a little uh, back and forth with Ernie Moniz, the past DOE secretary, who has the Energy Futures Initiative and with uh, President Trumka from the AFL-CIO. 
and and Senator Manchin spoke at it. Senator Sherrod Brown spoke at it because we're we're all looking at opportunities to actually use demonstrations of both CCUS and and clean hydrogen in the Ohio River Valley because it's an opportunity to get manufacturing humming again. We are not just going to be delivering electric vehicle charging stations. We are here to fundamentally reinvigorate the economy in a way that's going to make sense from a climate perspective, but make sense from a people perspective, really create jobs. You know, the president was thrilled with the number of jobs that was created last month. I think it was 850,000 new jobs. So he's up over 3 million jobs in, in a short, a shorter period of time than any president has been able to muster. And I think if you look at the popularity of what he's proposing, it feels like people are getting the fact that we're investing in America again. <laughs> we want to win the future. We want to grab back the supply chains. And we're going to do that in a way that's growing millions of jobs. It's a hugely popular proposal moving forward, uh, like staggeringly pro uh, uh, popular. And you can understand why. You know, people are tired and they're afraid and they need work and they need a home to live in and they need a shot at living in the middle class. You know, they need it. And, and I think this is the best way to deliver it is, yes, it's about clean energy. Yes, it's about climate. But more importantly, it, it's, it's about people and, and making this a kitchen table issue in terms of how do we bounce out of this pandemic into winning the 21st century economy. That's what this is all about. You talk about Senator Manchin, and, and of course, a lot of people are talking about Senator Manchin these days. Uh, you've got to keep Democrats united, and that includes uh, Senator Manchin, folks yeah. from coal country. I mean, he literally shot the cap and trade bill with a gun in 2009, right? So how do you win him over for something that would dramatically reduce the use of coal? I think, I think we're already doing that. And I think we're doing it by recognizing that life has changed since then. You know, clearly the climate crisis is, is front and center, but also coal has lost a considerable amount of jobs regardless of what got shot down with the transition is there. And part of what we wanted to do early on, and we found significant resources, like a, almost a half a billion dollars, to actually support job transition. I think it's been really important for Senator Manchin to both see that, that there is a future being built here that he can support to reinvigorate manufacturing and to bring economic development to his communities. But it's also about jobs. I mean, the, 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 uh, the, um, the, the plan that the bipartisan infrastructure uh, framework included significant amount of dollars just for cleanups of contaminated spaces, brownfields redevelopment to get the economic development going. It talks about you know investments in putting coal miners and others back to work in closing old coal mines. Folks who are in the oil and gas production sector can find a home closing thousands, if not millions of abandoned mines. And the resources are on the table in this plan to get this done. So there is nothing here other than opportunity investment here for communities like West Virginia and some places in Pennsylvania where we're all going to be visiting because it's time that they saw that they were part, part of the future and a future that this government is going to invest in. Um, and so I think there's every opportunity in the world to keep uh, 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 Senator Manchin not just communicating and talking, but feeling good about the investments that are being made. His, his state needs it as much as any other, if not more. One of the opportunities uh, for the future economically, but also in terms of uh, reducing emissions, it clearly is the auto sector, the, the transportation sector, the biggest source of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. And, and obviously EPA, your, your former agency, is rewriting the fuel economy and tailpipe standards. 
Environmental groups, including the one you previously led, said the administration needs to set clean car standards that will achieve a 60% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030. Will you do that? What did I know? I mean, really. <laughs> Um, uh, we are going to look really hard at, at doing a couple of things. And one is uh, to recognize that we've lost an awful lot of time uh, during the Trump administration and beyond. So we've been working with California really closely to look at how we can make up for lost time at, at, at a pace that's reasonable, but also one that's going to allow us to be sort of meeting some of the objectives that President Biden's put out there. On the power sector, we're talking about clean by 2035. It's not unreasonable to think that we may that we can achieve close to 100%, if not 100% of vehicles, but that's going to be up to the car companies and, and further steps forward to see how that can all lay out. But but what's but we so we are going to be looking at developing a rule that does catch up, developing a rule that goes further out, and we are going to continue to talk to the car companies who themselves some have mentioned sixty percent, and and a vast majority of them now I'm sorry that's that's an overstatement you can't say a vast majority of three because that's, it's the big three that we're paying the most attention to. But they have said everywhere from 40 to 60%. And they're looking at, you know, like if you talk to Mary Barrett's GM, it's 100% by, by 2035. So we'll see how these, these roll out, but we have to make sure that we're continuing to push. But frankly, we're working really hard with the UAW to make sure that, that they can see a path ahead for more union jobs on this. Because what we don't want to do is make sure that we're failing to pay attention to the manufacturing in the US and car manufacturing and battery manufacturing and increasing the amount of manufacturing we have of cars is the balance that the UAW is going to be looking for. And it's also going to be the way in which we drive demand forward. So I'm pretty excited about the opportunities there as well. So maybe I was smarter than I thought I was at NRDC, but then again, we're going to be looking at this and I'm not going to give any helpful hints at this point. <laughs> Um, well, you know, uh, you, you obviously talk with great passion, you and the president, about EVs and the opportunity to, to win the EV race. Uh, right now, there are states such as California and other countries such as China that are putting mandates in place to, to phase out the sale of conventional gasoline-powered cars. Should and how will the U.S. get firm targets in place for EV penetration so we don't forfeit, you know, this remarkable opportunity for EV jobs and investment? Yeah, I, I think that what you're seeing right now is that the companies themselves are gearing up to make that transition. And what you see in California is a is they have this uh, authority to, to set a zero emission vehicle standard. We don't enjoy that same authority. So we have to look at it through EPA regulations, which is really looking at what we expect to get for fleet averages. So we'll be looking, uh, obviously, at what we think is reasonable in terms of EV, EV penetration uh, between now and, and, uh, and the, the next uh, couple of rounds of light-duty vehicle rulemaking that we're going to be moving forward on. But it's, it's very clear, regardless, Jennifer, that there's no secret. You know, we're not instigating the car companies saying all of the stuff they're saying about electric vehicles is saying it because they want their investors to know that we're that they that they're going to invest in electric vehicles because that's where it's at. And so I think the bigger effort is to make sure that we grab the supply chain back here in the United States. So we're manufacturing the pots, we're manufacturing the batteries, and we're bringing the jobs back home that were offshored. Same with solar, same with wind. That's where all of the really interesting job growth opportunities are and where we can begin to really lay a foundation for clean energy uh, that's going to be lasting. Let me just follow up on that. I mean, you know, when we talk about sustainable supply chains, so much of the clean energy future depends on lithium. Uh, and yet there's just one large scale lithium plant, uh, mine rather, operating in the U.S. today. And of course, there's 
significant opposition from environmental interests, from Native Americans to some proposed mines in, in Nevada. What will the administration do to ensure the U.S. is producing more of that essential lithium domestically, uh, that in the transition to EVs, we don't trade a reliance on, you know, a volatile oil market for um, uh, a reliance on China and other countries for lithium and other components? Yeah, you're right. There is a need for us to to look at how we can make sure that we're not just not standing in the way, but encouraging the innovation in this area. And there's a couple of things that are going on. We actually have identified opportunities for lithium mining in a number of states. Uh, there's more of it than we ever thought was going to be available. And there's also investment in technologies in this area. The Department of Energy is heavily investing in a number of of uh, technologies where the lithium mine can be basically transformed into the quality lithium that you need for those batteries. And, and as a matter of fact, Mary Barrett GM just announced another multi-billion dollar you know, investment and partnership she has in, in one of these technologies for General Motors. So there is a, there's a lot going on in your right these areas have to be carefully handled. There's a need for governance structures, but there's also a need for us to understand that, that the, these vital materials are necessary and can be managed well so that they don't pose an environmental hazard, but they do open up the kind of opportunities for a clean energy future that we all want. I, I appreciate that. I, I know our time is short. I'd love to ask you just one more question. You know, sure. looking back at this weekend, the, the G20 finance ministers, they just recognized carbon pricing as a potential tool to combat climate change in Saturday's communique. Uh, of course, the European Union this week is about to unveil its plan for a carbon border adjustment. Given that a carbon border adjustment seems to tick a lot of boxes for this administration, I mean, it really aligns with the president's goals for, you know, spurring other countries to cut emissions, uh, improving U.S. competitiveness. Where is the administration on this issue? Does this administration support a border adjustment? Well, it's not off the table, certainly in any of the discussions. That's the most I can tell you. I mean, am I right? Do you see it as a tool to to help U.S. competitiveness, uh, our steelmaking industry, for example? There are there are many ways in which you could could look at that at a carbon border adjustment as an opportunity here. And I don't disagree with folks that that uh, are pushing on carbon pricing as a whole. Um, but I do think there are other strategies that may be more beneficial, both in terms of of putting an immediate boost into the system for, for the kind of clean energy investments that we're looking for, and also ensure the president's commitment to equity and justice. You know, the, a, 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 just a plain carbon price could end up landing on consumers, and we simply don't want that. The president wouldn't tolerate that. All the, all the pay fors for this is going to come from somebody other than folks who earn 400,000 or less. And so we have to be cautious about how you would design these strategies. And I know they're being discussed and I know there's a lot of ideas on the table about how we can ensure that this is done fairly and equitably, but that's going to be one of the president's major considerations because he has a, a passion to ensure that that, that we are investing in the communities left behind sufficiently that folks who are living in poverty get that opportunity to actually make it to the middle class. Um, that's the only way that we're going to have a robust system over time that I think everybody can enjoy.